Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former health commissioner here in Baltimore. Our goal is to bring evidence and experience to illuminate critical public health issues. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith Rogers, producer of Public Health on Call. Malaria is a mosquito borne infection that affects some 228 million people globally each year killing over 400,000 of them, primarily children under the age of five. In a two-part miniseries, Thomas Locke, host of the Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute podcast, Malaria Minute, will unpack the biology and history of one of the world's most serious health problems. Today, part one breaks down the parasite's unique life cycle, which allows it to adapt rapidly to drugs and to our immune system's efforts to fight it off. You can learn more about groundbreaking malaria research at malaria.jhsph.edu. That's malaria.jhsph.edu. Let's listen. Whenever you're ready, we'll send you into the chamber. We usually ask participants to remove their shoes and socks. You can take off your face mask. Okay, so I've just pulled open the door to the chamber. Climbing in now, and there's a piece of tin foil just on the floor. And my feet are sticking to it. And there we go. So I'm sat in this box. It's so small I have to climb in. And I'm sat in the centre on this tiny chair. Outside the box is Stephanie. She's a postdoc at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Her research is all about understanding which smells mosquitoes are most attracted to. So this box is a scent chamber. Those machines, whirring away in the background, are collecting my scent. And this box shows two key players in malaria transmission, the human and the mosquito. But connecting the two, the parasite. Its name? Plasmodium. I'm Thomas Locke, a student from the UK, and for years I've been fascinated with malaria and the global efforts to fight it. Today, on Malaria Mondays, a new mini-series from Public Health on Call, we're asking what makes the plasmodium parasite so good at infecting us. We're following the parasite's fascinating journey through the human and mosquito. Bear with me, because it's a complex and at times bizarre life cycle. But as you'll see, its complexity is its secret to success. And it all starts with a mosquito bite. Imagining these parasites entering into the human, I asked Diane Wirth of Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health what they look like. They're like, I would say, kind of like small worms, very small worms that propel themselves through a specialized mechanism called gliding motility. But the mosquito only injects a handful of these worm-like parasites. Right now, in the skin, they're vulnerable. So the parasite begins a perilous journey to find somewhere it can hide away. It heads to the liver. There's a small number of parasites that actually make the journey to the liver. As few as one, maybe as many as a few dozen. The time from the bite to the infection in the liver is under an hour. Moving quickly in the bloodstream, the parasites arrive at the liver. The main goal, if parasites could have a goal, is to replicate, to make as many copies of themselves as they can. And usually, cells replicate one to two. One replicates and then creates a second one. But in plasmodium, in the liver... The replication seems to occur synchronously. So all of the copies of DNA are created, and then the parasite divides. It's an unusual division process. In a period of seven to ten days, you go from one parasite to 10 to the fifth parasites, so a huge multiplication which sets up the infection. This gives the parasites safety in numbers, creating hundreds of thousands of new parasites. But this weird way of replicating isn't the only weird thing it does. Do you believe in shape-shifting, that something can be one thing one minute and something else the next? Not possible, right? Well, those parasites that travel to the liver They were called sporozoites, 
but leaving the liver, those sporozoites, those small worms have become... A bit egg-shaped, I would say, maybe a, a egg with a cone on one end. They shapeshift. They form what's called a merozoite. From sporozoite, the parasite transforms into the merozoite. That is the form of the parasite that can then invade red cells. Malaria is primarily an infection of red blood cells, and that's the next step in their progression. Coming out of the liver, coming out of hiding, the merozoites go on to our next stop, the blood. They start to infect red blood cells and turn them into a factory to produce even more parasites. Joel Vega Rodriguez, NIH. As soon as the merozoite invades the red blood cell, it will form what is known as the ring stage. The ring stage is called the ring stage because... Because it looks like, like an actual ring. Right. In the red blood cell, the ring stage. And the ring will transform into another stage, the trophozoite. And it's the trophozoite that does the work of the factory to produce more parasites. This is a little confusing, so to take a step back. The goal of all of this is to build up the parasite infection in the human. The parasite never wants to be vulnerable, so it always needs to make more of itself. So here, in red blood cells, trophozoites create more merozoites. From one parasite, each red blood cell will produce about 32 merozoites. And these daughter cells then will burst the red blood cells, will get released, and then will go on to infect more red blood cells. The parasite will keep cycling in between red blood cells, and it will slowly consume the red blood cells from the human. The blood stage represents a major escalation of infection, and at this stage, you start to get symptoms. Fever, every 48 hours, as a result of red blood cells bursting with parasites. And anemia, a loss of red blood cells, because the parasite starts to use them all up. Once you have an advanced infection in the human, you can have millions or billions of parasites circulating in your body. There's a lot of activity going on here in the blood. Merozoites infecting red blood cells, turning them into a factory to produce even more merozoites, bursting free to invade more red cells. Why can't the immune system put a stop to this process? When the parasite invades the red blood cell, it transforms the surface of the cell. It produces its own proteins. It exports these proteins to the surface of the red blood cell, making these cells more sticky. If the spleen found one of our merozoite factories in the red blood cell, it would certainly kill it. It's responsible for filtering the blood that circulates around the body. And that's the key word. Circulating. Instead of circulating in the blood, the parasite's sticky red blood cells bind to the lining of blood vessels. There, tucked away, they can keep producing more of themselves and avoid clearance by the spleen. But the way that it hides, this stickiness, can create blockages in organs. Important for cerebral malaria, a major complication of the disease, blockages in the brain. Terry Taylor, Michigan State University. We're seeing symptoms because of the after effects of how it's hiding. Coma is often ushered in by a convulsion. And they can involve the whole body. They can involve one finger twitching. Kids, while in coma, can adopt different postures. Their body can assume different contorted shapes. A whole neurological textbook can occur over the course of many patients. It's quite astonishing. Cerebral malaria is life-threatening. But Terry, who spends six months of the year in Malawi researching the disease, confirms that... The vast majority of malaria infections are asymptomatic. Among the small proportion who become ill, most of those people develop uncomplicated malaria. Fever, chills, nausea, vomiting, headache, they feel miserable. A small proportion of those who are too young to have had enough experience with malaria to develop immunity, a small proportion of that group go on to develop complicated disease, and cerebral malaria is one form of that. And when those signs of successful infection start to show, the parasite starts thinking about the next stage in its life cycle, the mosquito. As the parasite develops in the human, there are signals, including anemia, for example, that are telling it, you need to get out of this host. If the human dies, so does the parasite. So as the symptoms develop, the parasite prepares to get out. 
a number of merozoites shapeshift into a new mosquito stage. And it's extremely important because the parasite must go through the mosquito in order to complete the life cycle, in order to transmit to a new host. The mosquito can't be infected with merozoites, these blood stages. The new stage is called the gametocyte. And when a female Anopheles mosquito lands and bites the human, those gametocytes will be taken up into its stomach. Connor McMenamin, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And actually there's two forms of gametocytes, um, female gametocytes and also male gametocytes. After the mosquito blood feeds on an infected human, red blood cells containing the parasite are taken into the mosquito midgut, its stomach. They find each other. There's a process of fertilization, much like sperm and egg coming together, to form the zygote or egg. This egg moves in the mosquito's stomach to its lining. There, it produces a stage of the parasite I think you'll find familiar. After a period of time, this bursts out to liberate immature sporozoids, which then undergo a migration into the mosquito's salivary glands. From the salivary gland, the mosquito will infect a new human host with sporozoites, and the life cycle starts again. And this life cycle has played itself out over millions of years. Exactly, right. This is an ancient disease. It's been with humans. As humans evolved, it has an origin in primates. The parasite has evolved over millions of years to evade the human immune system. There are hundreds, if not a thousand genes in the parasite genome devoted to what I would call immune evasion. I think the most interesting part of the parasite is how the parasite has evolved or figured out how to escape our immune system, but also how it has developed or evolved to know when it's time to get out of the body. Here's the crucial point. If you think about the diseases humans have been able to eliminate, they're almost all diseases where if you get infected and survive, you'll be immune for the rest of your life. Prior to vaccination, children who got measles or chickenpox had the disease, and then they had immunity the rest of their lives. In the case of malaria, that's not true. You can be infected with malaria over and over again. This is why Plasmodium is so good at infecting us. Evolved over millions of years alongside humans, it knows how to evade our immune system. It can keep infecting us again and again. Highly adapted at each stage, it does those weird things replicating synchronously, shape-shifting into an entirely different form, making red blood cells sticky, all with the goal of growing its numbers and evading the immune system. Disrupting this complex life cycle can disrupt malaria transmission. And for Stephanie, that's all about disrupting the mosquito's attraction to human scent. Hi, Stephanie. How's it going? Good, how are you? I'm good, thanks. It's been a week since I sat in the scent chamber. Loaded up on the computer, Stephanie's got the results. Oh, this is, this is you. This is me? This is you. This is the kind of output we get, so it's called a chromatogram. Um, and each of these peaks here you see is an individual chemical. But there's sort of about a dozen or so major peaks, but then if you look down here, there's kind of... Wow. Yeah, hundreds. 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 So, what do I smell like? One of the major peaks is acetic acid, um, which we see in pretty much all of our participants. It's a very common bacterial metabolite, so this is usually coming from the feet. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't have recorded this. If we can figure out which people are most attractive to mosquitoes, look at their chemical odor, maybe we can find out what's so special about those people on a chemical level. Mm -hmm. The end goal of this is to create a trap that's baited with a synthetic chemical that smells like the most attractive human. A mosquito trap that smells like the most attractive human could help disrupt malaria transmission, a new tool in the fight against malaria. But existing tools, whether drugs or vector control, haven't been enough to eradicate malaria. And we've tried. So why did we fail at global eradication? Will the world's first malaria vaccine get us there? And more fundamentally, Why do we still have malaria today? That's next time on Malaria Mondays, a new mini-series from Public Health On Call. 
I'm Thomas Locke. Thanks for listening. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Holes Fernandez and Amber Bryan Singletary. Thank you for listening.